Welcome to the James study by the Christian boys. Even though I'm without my sidekick today, Captain Romans, that'll be all right. I know I mentioned in our intro video that I was going to do a study over things like meekness, biblical womanhood and manhood, all of these type of topics that are going to take a lot of study and a lot of time to prepare. And that's okay. I'm going to get to those eventually. But for the time being, I want to be able to present something that will hopefully be fruitful and something that you can enjoy uh, for now that uh, hopefully will just be a, a good study. So let's go ahead and jump into it. I'm just going to go ahead and read James 1. Uh, for your reference, I'm going to be reading out of the New King James Version. Uh, I think out of most of my study, I'm going to use the New King James, unless I need to reference something else out of another version. So that's typically what I'm going to be using for this study in particular. So let's hop right into it. And we're only getting to James 1.1 today. So James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. So in our study of James, uh, I want to talk about a few things, and I want to pull things out that we not, might not normally look at. So what we're going to try and pull out of this study, what my study of James is going to be, is, is the Lord over my whole life? Is the Lord God truly working in me? Is he truly the Lord of my life? Is this what I live for? Is this my purpose? Is this my reason? What does that look like in a Christian life? So that's what could be one of our big questions is, is the Lord, is God the Lord over my entire life? This next one is something I've actually been challenged on. And that is, where is grace in the book of James? And I think it's going to be something that's challenging, uh, but it's going to be something fruitful and fun that we're going to hopefully be able to pull out of this book. Uh, so I, I think that it's going to be not what people typically expect to pull out of the book of James, but I think we're going to be able to do it. So before we answer these two questions through our study, I want to go ahead and just define what these two things are. So let's start with what is a Lord. So in the definition of a Lord, is someone or something having power, authority, or influence, a master or ruler? So we're going to dive more into what a Lord truly looks like. But that's our overarching theme of a Lord. Somebody who has power, authority, influence, is a master or ruler. So these things are going to be very important for our study to know that is this the law of our master, of our, of our Lord, the one who reigns over all things? Is this the law? Do we need to follow it? What, what are these things we're looking at? So these are all questions we're going to answer throughout the study. But I just want to put that definition out there right at the beginning. Let us know what is a Lord. Uh, secondly, uh, the definition of grace. So uh, with our study on grace, I'm going to give a couple different definitions because I think that how we're going to use this and how it's going to be applied in the James study is going to be a little different than, like I said, what we're typically used to. So a brief summary. The first definition we're going to use, the free and unmerited favor of God as manifested in the salvation of sinners and the bestowal of blessings. Uh, so that is the definition you get from the Christian belief. It is what if you just do a general internet search, it's going to tell you our Christian belief is. But we're going to do a couple more as well. A period officially allowed for payment of a sum due or for compliance with law or conditions, especially an extended period granted as a special favor. Another definition we could see for that. Unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification. A virtue coming from God, a state of sanctification enjoyed through divine assistance, manifestation of favor, especially by superior. So of all these definitions, I just want you to be thinking about these things and keep them in mind as we go through James, because we're going to pull these things out and we're going to look at them and evaluate how that is applied in our lives, because James is a book of common sense. Uh, it's also been known as the gospel of common sense. So 
we're gonna look at that and see how that's actually used in our lives. So now we've got our idea of where this study is gonna go and what we're trying to do with it. Let's talk about who James is, because before we actually dive into a book written by him, who is he? So we're not actually told directly who James is, but through ruling out all the other possible candidates, James is the brother of Jesus Christ. And when I say that in a Protestant view, I mean Adelphos, which directly means brother. Uh, the reason we can rule out cousin from our perspective is that we have another word for cousin. It's a nipsios. And you see it in Colossians 4.10. So we don't believe that this was a cousin. We believe it's the brother. Just for reference of who this person is and what this meant to uh, the authority of what he's saying. So he was also an apostle. He was one that sent out. He's not one of the 12 apostles. Uh, so that's going to be a big role to play whenever we're talking about who James is, because even though he was the brother of Christ, he was not actually walking with Christ in the time that he was actually teaching. Um, so now we know which James we're talking about. Let's kind of dive in a little bit who James was. So James was also called James the Just. Uh, Eusebius is the one that tells us about that. Eusebius is considered the father of church history, and he's the one that tells us a good deal about James. So one of the things, not only does he call him James the Just, but he gives us a small section that's saved and been preserved from an earlier church father who says, want to go alone into the sanctuary and used to be found prostate on his knees and asking forgiveness for the people so that his knees grew hard and worn like a camel's because he was ever kneeling and worshiping God and asking forgiveness for the people. So James was truly a just man. He was not just looking for himself. He was looking out for the people. So he was not just praying for himself. He was praying for all those that they might get forgiveness. And I think that's a huge deal that we miss out on too much in our Christian nation is that we're always concerned about me, me, me. And I think we should look at James here and take a cue from this and go, okay, maybe we should be praying for others. Even though James was a just, he wasn't truly walking with Christ in the time that he was teaching. Now, how we know this? We know it from a few different verses. And I'm just going to give some examples, but we know more. So I'm going to give Matthew 12. The end of Matthew 12 and the end of Matthew 13. So in Matthew 12, 46 through 50, it says, While he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside, seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand towards the disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whosoever, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him, but Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So I think it's kind of funny how human nature works and the fact that James was one of the people that were closest to Jesus and didn't recognize him as Messiah. It's almost like you see this pretty commonly and whenever you have a friend and maybe you're trying to give him advice and it's like it's just not getting through and you kind of wonder like, why are they not listening like I'm their closest friend? And then somebody else that maybe doesn't even hardly know them will give them literally the same exact advice. 
and all of a sudden they listen and you wonder why is this not hitting? Why is it not hitting home? And I think it's just part of our human nature. We know each other so well, those that are close to us that we don't really have that outside view of like, okay, maybe this person is capable of more. I think that's just human nature. So it's funny to see that that's played out with James here, that he doesn't even recognize Jesus as Messiah. He just knows him as his brother. I think it's almost, uh, it's kind of funny just to see the human nature. So I think it's cool too that, you know, being his brother and not recognizing him, that he did repent and was saved afterwards, that he was so influential in the early churches after he had not walked with Christ during his ministry. Like that's such a uh, testimony to how true the Bible is. Uh, just another great reference of that. So let's talk about the 12 tribes that are that is a callback to the Old Testament. So when he's talking about the 12 tribes, he's not just saying the Jewish people uh, in the Old Testament. He's It's a callback that's saying, hey, we are in the same situation that we were whenever we were dispersed. This is the dispersion of the 12 tribes, which is also known as Jacob's descendants of the house of Israel, right? So he's talking about the church that is being dispersed out and is growing. He had more of a Jewish audience, obviously, because he was leading the Jewish church, but he recognized that all people could come to Christ. And again, this is just a callback to the Jewish audience and another great pool of the Old Testament. Um, so again, it's called the Gospel of Common Sense. We're going to see that as we go through. I think it's pretty cool to see something that's just so uh, blatant and obvious, but yet we miss it so easily, all of these concepts. As we're applying it in today's time, we can remember that human nature is always the same. We can see that how he reacted to Jesus. And I think we're going to see that as we go through that, you know, time changes and things are different, but human nature never really changes. So uh, I think that's why we need God so much. I just want to talk about the book of James a little bit. And I know that when we go through this, it's going to be some convicting things, some things that maybe make us sit back on our feet and uh, really take these things in. If it's convicting you, if it's hitting your heart, let it. Don't fight it. If these things speak to you, if they say, hey, we need to change, we need to make a difference, we need to do what God is calling us to do, let that impact your heart. Let it fill you. Let it change you. Don't kick. Uh, it said, you know, not to kick against the goads. And I think that's kind of funny because it's whenever they're hurting and they're poking, uh, they actually had these things they would poke with called the goads. And whenever they would poke them and they would kick against them, it would actually hurt the livestock even worse. So that's essentially what we're doing is God's trying to lead us in a direction. We're kicking against the goads. So uh, let's not hurt ourselves worse and take these things in and truly let them sit on our heart. Like I say, God's word should not make you angry. It should not make you rebellious. It should make you filled with the spirit and it should make you realize where we go wrong. And it should also make us uplifted in the things that we're doing and we can see ourselves changing. We should be filled with his spirit and we should see those fruits. And James is a book that's either going to tell you, uh, hey, you're walking in the fruits or you're not. And I think it's just, it's so cool because it's so down to earth. It's so common sense. It's so plain and straightforward. And we just need to take these things in. So like I say, we're just getting through James 1 right now. I just want to introduce it. I want to tell you what we're going to do in this study. I want to give you uh, everything you're going to need to be ready to go because we're going to dive into this and really try and pull everything we can out of this book. So uh, let me just pray us out because that's something I want to do in all my videos. Let you know that uh, I love you and I'm here for you. Uh, these things are meant to edify uh, all of us that are looking to learn God's will. So again, let me pray us out and uh, God be with you. So dear Lord, just thank you for this day. Thank you for the ability to share this lesson online. And thank you for those that are hearing it, that they may be filled with your spirit 
and they may be shown some truth in your word. And dear Lord, just thank you for all these things that you give us, all these things that you do. Thank you for your living word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.